the previous section, we described the basics of closed loop control and showed how they can be implemented in Labview. By the end of this module, you'll be able to describe how shared resources can cause jitter in your real time system. So, what is a shared resource? A shared resource is any resource that can be used by only one process at a time. This is something that if two processes wish to use simultaneously, one of them has to wait. You want to avoid shared resources to minimize jitter, because any time a process needs to wait, that's going to add jitter to its execution time. The more shared resources you have, the more likely that you're going to encounter jitter added to your system. So one of the questions that we receive quite often is, what exactly is it a shared resource? Why is that a problem? The reason why it's a problem is before a process can begin using a shared resource, it first must get permission to do so. Now, that's known as obtaining a mutual exclusion object or a mutex. Basically, that provides the permission to use. In this case, the process one is running and accesses the shared resource. Process two is not allowed to get access to the mutex for that shared resource until process one finishes. This is very similar to real world scenarios where there's only a single item of use. For example, a serial port within a system is typically used by only one process at a time, or even the monitor is only used by one window at a time if it is maximized. Similarly, in a hardware-based application, If we have only one analog output, we have to make one location. If we have a memory resource where we're storing values within a current value table, we have to make sure that only one portion of that system gets access at a time. We'll also use shared resources as a protection mechanism for items that can't be accessed from multiple locations without causing a risk of corruption. We'll talk about some examples soon. Some of the resources within LabVRT that are considered shared are global variables, non-reentrant sub-VIs, so this could be a functional global variable if you are using those within your system, queue operations, the LabVIEW memory manager, single-threaded DLLs, shared variables, Semaphore VIs, Philo, and networking code. As you might imagine, this is a pretty long list, and almost every LabVIEW application is going to contain one or more of these items. The key is knowing which of these items are critical to your system, which ones can be moved to non-deterministic processes, and which ones are necessary for the operation of the system and cannot be avoided. Notice that three of these items, Semaphore VIs, File IO, and networking code, are inherently non-deterministic. This is because it is not under the control of your program as to how long these will take to execute. We recommend that you do not put any of these items, Semaphore VIs, File IO, or Networking Code, within your time critical loop. Time critical loop should contain the minimal amount of jitter possible, which means these non-deterministic items should be moved to other processes within your program. In the previous section, we described how shared resources can cause jitter. By the end of this module, you'll be able to describe interprocess communication considerations and mechanisms within LabVRT. When we talk about interprocess communication, this means communication between parallel processes on the same target. In LabVIEW, that typically means talking from one loop to another. In the case of this example, if we had a control loop that was our time critical loop that's running in a timed loop, and it needs to send certain data over to a low priority logging loop implemented in a while loop. Such data might be a set point, the current temperature, the current time. We will typically want to log those to file occasionally so we keep a record of what the system is doing. We definitely don't want that logging loop to get in the way of our critical control process, however. So we're going to have to pick a data transfer mechanism that will not get in the way. So to pick what type of data transfer mechanism we should use here, we have a couple of things that we have to figure out. First step 
what type of data transfer are we doing here? If you recall, the three types of data that we can deal with are going to be tags, streams, or messages. Second step is, now that we've determined what type of data we're moving, are we communicating between a determinist loop and a non-deterministic loop? Do we have to worry about these loops interfering with each other? If we have two non-deterministic loops talking to each other, it's not as much of a concern because if two relatively unimportant tasks interfere, it's all right because the high priority important tasks would still be able to continue without any interruption. So let's take a quick review again of those three data transfer types, tags, streaming, and messages. Current value data, or tags, is going to be data that's stored made globally accessible, one location that is available to many. And typically the storage mechanism will only hold the current value. Latest value only, no history, no buffer, just the latest value that's present in the system. Some examples where you probably see this are configuration data, something that's set once, current value data such as our temperature uh, that was most recently read from a thermocouple, or non-critical messages that can be received whenever there's time. Streaming. This is going to be a continuous stream of data, so constant or at least for an extended period of time. This is often going to be a lossless buffer transmission because we want to ensure that all the data data gets to the other side. And this is also typically going to be a point to point transmission, so a one-to-one -one relationship. Requiring data from sensors, we don't want to lose any of that data. We want to take all of it and pass it to the next node in the system for processing, of storage, or analysis. Maybe an image or large sets of. When we speak of messages or commands, this is something where we definitely want to make sure it is received, and typically with low latency. We must define the format of the message so we know what we're communicating and know how to un that data on the other side, and it may or may not require a response or acknowledgement. Depending on your architecture, you may have multiple starter endpoints for your message. Architecture. Typical examples, state machines, event process, messaging systems, commanding a system to do something right now. It is what you're going to use for messages and commands. That's in contrast to We may have a non-critical message. Perhaps we don't. Don't mind if we lose a message. We're dealing with a message or command.
different type of use case, we want to make sure that all of that gets across. and that we don't lose anything. 